Hi, I'm Julie Thompson. Welcome to the Plymouth School Committee Candidate Interview. I want to take a moment to thank our candidate for participating in this interview and collaborating with PAC-TV to bring this informational programming to residents and voters this election season. Let me explain the format. We will be conducting a one-on-one -on -one interview style Q&A format with each candidate lasting about 30 minutes. Responses will not be timed and follow-up questions may be asked during this format. We aim to ask up to about four to five questions, but that will depend on the length of responses along with any follow-up discussion during this exchange. Candidates will be allowed to address anything not covered or that they'd like to add clarification to at the end of the interview in their closing remarks. So let's get started. Today we're speaking with Luis Pisano, one of the three candidates for school committee in the Plymouth Town election. Luis, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. So we're going to get right into the questions. All right. Okay, question number one. Maintenance and upkeep of town buildings is always an issue, especially with the age of the elementary and middle schools in town. Maintenance and redistricting are the primary reasons that the closing of the Hedge Elementary is up for consideration. Would you please weigh in on this entire debate? Sure. Well, one, let me start by saying I'm not in favor of the near-term closing of uh, Hedge, Ele Hedge Elementary. Mm -hmm. um, I think it was unfortunate that the uh, results of the district-wide uh, building uh, assessment came in kind of at the same, same time as the redistricting committee was meeting. So it kind of forced uh, some considerations, you know, some uh, building condition considerations into that uh, discussion. It was never the uh, intention. Um, I think having that information now, I think it's appropriate that we, the, the school committee and the administration actually take a step back. Um, I, I think to do this right, we really need a comprehensive uh, building plan for you know both, whether it's maintenance or renovation or re replacing buildings before we under, you know before we're making decisions on, on redistricting. Um, to me, we have a, a pretty significant uh, elementary school building you know potential crisis. You know our newest schools built in 1977, um, so all of them need some uh, serious in investment. Mm -hmm. um, you know hedge you know is no different in terms of its needs than Nathaniel Morton or Cold Spring. So there really isn't a good reason to uh, sing, single it out. Um, you know, I, I think people acknowledge that there maybe is some limited um, life in it, but it isn't next year or even two years from now. Um, so I think the right approach would be to f do a full district-wide assessment, figure out what, what we need, what makes sense, work with the state to figure out whether we need to build new schools or invest in the existing buildings. And then based on those results, do some redistricting because mm -hmm. it wouldn't make sense to me to redistrict now and then potentially build new schools in you know five or ten years and then have to redistrict again then. Mm -hmm. So I, I think we just need to take a step back and really you know, put out a, a comprehensive plan uh, to the public and gather more um, community feedback and input. Right, and that's, that's kind of one of the important things because obviously the people that have kids in schools are honed into this, mm -hmm. um, this debate. But people that don't have kids, especially not in the elementary schools, the high school or beyond or they just don't have kids in the system, it's not as much of a, a, a pressing issue for them. So how do you, uh, given the fact that a few million dollars were, were put out as far as what the work is going to be needed on mm -hmm. that, one, and you know that once you start renovating a school, you have to have the whole school brought up to code. Mm -hmm. So you're not talking about small, small money here. No. So how do you message this problem to the greater Plymouth community who, who might not have kids in school? Sure, well, two, two things. One, I would say, you know, think about, you know, most of those people had kids previously, they went to schools. This is an investment in y your future. Uh, it, it can't, it, it, to me, it's unfortunate, it's a, to me, it's a selfish attitude to think that it was fine for the public to pay for public education when you needed it. And now that, you know, you don't need it anymore. You know, you can wash your hands of it. Um, so one, I, I would ask people to really, you know, think about, you know, not not your your own needs, but you know, f future needs and the needs of you know, f uh, families that do have kids in school or are going to have kids in school. Mm -hmm. Two, doing nothing really isn't an option here. Um, you know, the, these you, it's like choosing to do nothing on your house. Mm -hmm. You can choose that, but eventually the roof will cave in or something, and you're going to have to replace it. And right. that's the situation we're in with a lot of these school buildings. So. Spending zero isn't an option. It's, it's what we need to do is more of a business case analysis, if you will, and decide it does it make sense, you know, to spend you know X number of millions on this particular building, mm -hmm. or are we better off spending millions on a new building? 
either way, you have long-term uh, you know, maintenance needs. Right. Um, even our you know, brand new high schools, those both schools still require millions to keep them up. You know, when you look at the next you know, 10, 20 years, because sure. you want to keep them in the condition that they're in now that we're all proud of. Right. So doing nothing isn't going to be an option. So the, the, those uh, folks that don't have kids in school need to understand, we're going to spend money here. It's mm -hmm. a, what the school committee and administration job needs to be is figure out how to best spend that money and how to get the most uh, back from it, because spending zero isn't an option. Okay. <clears throat> Question number two. Each year, the district is asked to keep its budget increase to a minimal amount. Yet, when it presents a level service budget, the increase always seems to be a bit more. Can you explain what a level service budget is and why the budget continues to increase when the school population seems to decrease? So uh, first, uh, level service budget is basically figuring out within today's dollars how much we're going to have to spend in order to provide the exact same level of service we did um, last year. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't mean that the budget doesn't change because there's inflation. Everybody in the district um, deserves a raise every year, um, you know, from teachers down to the, the maintenance folks, custodians, paras, you know, secretaries. Um, that's built in, you know, to contracts, and there's very few few union contracts you'd ever find that don't have you know, those kind of increases in every year. 80% of the school budget is salaries. Mm -hmm. So just by virtue of those you know, well-deserved increases, the budget's gonna increase even if nothing else um, uh, changes. You know, I, I think the school department has done an incredibly good job of staying within their budgets. Um, I don't know that, you know, I'm sure they've probably gone over at some point, but mm -hmm. you'd have to go pretty far back. Um, you know, last year we gave a million dollars back to the town um, this year we're coming in under budget, so um, you know I, I think that the schools do do a very good job of staying within within their bounds. Okay, now there's a lot of people that don't understand as part of the budgeting process, um, you have to talk about funded and unfunded mandates. Mm. So can you explain to the people exactly what that means and give us some examples? Sure. Um, so. Unfunded or underfunded mandates or any uh, requirements that come down from either the state or the federal government um, that require us to spend money in order to implement a particular policy or piece of legislation. Um, examples of that are the uh, McKinney-Vento Act that um, uh, applies to homeless children, mm -hmm. um, busing of uh, uh, kids that go to uh, the charter schools. Mm -hmm. um, go back to the, the one about the homeless children. What is, what is the, what so do you for, have to do? Uh, for the McKinney-Vento program requires us to, one, it requires that all homeless children have access to education. And depending where they are, we, they have to be, we have to provide transportation. So a child could be, say, homeless in, you know, Kingston, but um, has, you know, ties to Plymouth. We are required to tran transport that student to uh, Plymouth. Okay. That's just an example, but it could be, you know, they could be much further away, but wherever they are, you know, we're required to. And probably if you look at all of these unfunded uh, mandate requirements, they're all very good programs. There's, mm -hmm. I don't think there's anyone that I would argue against. Mm -hmm. The problem is not having the, the, the funding come along with it in order to uh, implement them. Um, probably one that is very relevant to Plymouth is the requirement for ELL uh, students. So we Which are required English, English language learners. Sorry. Language learners. learners, okay. Correct. And those, they can be from folks, kids that know absolutely zero English yep. to kids that know some amount to kids that are, you know, coming along well. But we're required, you know, schools are required to provide them with a, you know, full experience, adequate, you know, education yep. and meet them wherever their language uh, skills are. Right. Um, you know, my family came here from Mexico. I was an English English, English language learner my, myself yep, when yep. I started out. So I completely su su support that right. legislation and think it's the right thing to do. Okay. Problem is in, in Plymouth, our English language learner population has gone up 4x in the last 15 years. Right. And you don't, and you can't really count, you don't know how many you exactly, have Exactly. Yeah. We, we okay. yeah. We're pretty confident <laughs> it's going to keep going up because there's no, you know, something indicates it's going to go down. Okay. But the fact is that costs the district a significant amount of money. Right. And you know we're happy to do it. We welcome these uh, yep. students and we want them to thrive. Um, but it's frustrating when we don't have that you know money coming from the state to compensate. So none uh, of that is reimbursed by the state, even though you're required by the state to do this. Uh, it's part of our, it's part of our you know, operating budget. So you know technically there's dollars in there from our state funding, but there's oh, nothing okay. specifically that's coming for those uh, okay. students that really adds up to it. It probably costs the town at least a million dollars a year right now, and you know growing. So right. those are you know examples of things that you know, put additional pressure on our budgets. Sure. Do you get any pushback about um, sending kids to charter schools? I know there's a, 
you know, there's always been a little bit of a debate about, you know, why should we pay for kids going to a charter school? Yeah, I, I can't say that we've gotten, that, or at least not myself, gotten, you know, pushback. It's an ongoing debate what the right way to do it. Because there's obviously plenty of arguments for those charter schools. Right. Um, it's always been debate in public how, what's, what's the right way to, you know, fund them. Um, right. It's, I, I think the challenge becomes when it, that funding becomes a strain on, you know, the actual, uh, on the, you know, the, the, the normal school district there in, in, in town. Right. Um, you know, I, I wouldn't advocate that those charter schools shouldn't exist. Right. But um, th it certainly puts pressure on how we operate, you know, our, yeah. our budget. Yeah. Okay. Now, what about out-of-district services? Now, that's something else that you have to have in the budget. And what is an out-of-district service, for example? So, out-of-district services are uh, services that the, the district may not uh, provide directly here. So for instance, uh, if there's a program that a student wants to take advantage of that we just don't offer here in the district, okay. we have to, you know, get those students to, you know, an uh, uh, adequate program at, that's somewhere out of the, the district. And this is separate from a student that, say, just lives in Duxbury that wants to go to Plymouth or vice versa. Right. Um, that, you know, the, the uh, district has taken a, a stance that, you know, we actually don't participate in right. um, th those kind of exchanges. Okay. But for out-of-district services, you know, we, we have to, you know, uh, you know, do what we can to support those students. Right. So, for example, would it be if you had a student who was blind, um, and you can't, who you couldn't help here? But Correct. There was another exactly. district that did. You could you could have them go. Okay. Absolutely blind. Okay. Exactly. Yeah. There is no blind or deaf school here in, right. in so town. It's, it's, and so, if those students want to go to a school that caters to them, right. we have to you know okay. pay for them to get there. Okay. Uh, both both funding and actually transportation. And do you how do you have to do this for all? Four years that there. This is just high school, I assume, right? That you're uh, talking about. That I'm not positive. Okay. I, I believe it might apply to all 13 years, but that I'm not okay. sure. Okay. Okay. Um, but that's just another thing that's added to the budget. Correct. Okay. Uh, question number three: With the increasing costs of attending colleges, many students are looking to join the trades or go into certificate mm. or licensed programs instead. Plymouth has a very strong tech studies program. At both, at both high schools, which are really, really popular, so that not all students who apply are accepted into those programs. How can the district accommodate or support students who are interested in the trades if they aren't accepted into the programs? That's a great uh, question. We, we do have a fabulous uh, technical uh, program, um, and it, it, this kind of relates back to the previous question as well, because there's, you know, it, a lot of it comes down to bu budget. Mm -hmm. um, there simply isn't, uh, you know, unlimited budget or space to accommodate, you know, every student that would want to take, right. uh, be, participate in those kind of programs. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think the real issue is with the admission uh, processes. Um, I think there's been far too much focus on grades and having this, you know, perfect behavior record. Mm -hmm. um, the whole point of these programs is to provide career opportunities to kids. Mm -hmm. And to me, to not give a kid an opportunity because he didn't have perfect grades is doing the exact opposite. Mm -hmm. um, the whole point of these programs is to give kids the op opportunities. Um, you know, when I was in middle school, I spent far more than my fair share in middle school detention. <laughs> that would have almost certainly disqualified <laughs> right. me from these programs. Yeah. Yet, you know, I went on to attend and graduate from MIT. Right. So I, I am proof that you can that a kid can be turned turned around. Right. Um, and so I think we need to do a better job of making sure that the right kids are making it the, into these uh, programs. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if it was up to me and we had a limited budget, everyone should get to participate. Right. But short of that, we need to make sure that we're giving opportunities to the right kids and giving kids a leg up and, you know, despite their middle school background, yeah. helping them, you know, yeah. giving them the opportunity, which, because that's the whole point of these programs. Right. And, and as they're getting more and more popular, do you increase the number that you will allow in each year or should that be part of your, pro I your think planning that, process? I think that's be part of the planning process and, and budgeting uh, process. Because right now, I, I think we're really just uh, limited on what we can, you know, the, the space you can't have, right. you know, in, in the culinary program, you know, a, a kit kitchen is only so big. Exactly. You can't have 100 right. kids in there. So right. there are finite limits to what we can do with the current um, current programs right. and spaces we have. Is there any ever been any talk about, I remember double sessions back when I was a, a kid, where you'd have two literally two, yeah. two separate school days 
in a case like this, maybe you could accommodate more kids. Yeah, there, there hasn't been talk about that, um, but I think that's something that should be put on the table. I, I think we do need to figure out a way. But again, that would cost additional dollars, oh, right, and so right. you got to go back. Yep. To the collector go back and say, to the budget. Hey, hey, we need more money. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, I, I think there's lots of things we, we would do uh, and would do better, you know, if we had an unlimited yeah, budget. Yeah. We don't. But I mean, I will say, we, we, I think we're pretty. We're pretty well funded in Plymouth, and taxpayers have been pretty supportive. Yeah. Um, but there's always, you know, some pushback. Um, yeah. So I think that's that's always the fine balance. Right, and there always will be. Yeah. <laughs> right. Okay. Question number four: The district is in the process of hiring a diversity, equity, and inclusion coordinator. Why is this position needed at this point, and what do you see as the outcome of having a person in this role? And then also as a follow-up, in in your estimation, why is this position seen as controversial? In by some, in some cases. Um, yeah, a lot of questions there. Um, I'll start with one. I'm, I'm proud to support the creation of this um, uh, position. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, you can't say that it's, you know, it's. I don't think you can use the word necessary. Mm -hmm. um, to me, this is a, you know, something that enhances the district and will help make it uh, better. Um, you know, I think it, it's in line with the district's mission to make the Plymouth Public Schools a welcoming environment for everybody. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and diversity can be defined a little different ways. It's, you know, religious, racial, cultural, yeah. um, you know, y you, you name it. Um, and our, the district's strategic plan has a lot of, you know, diversity, equity, and inclusion el elements to it. Right. Having someone actually focus on making those ideas come to fruition I think is important. Um, I think one of, one of the big values of this role is providing support to our teachers and providing consistency across the district. Right yeah. now, you know, some teachers are more sensitive to things than others or trying to do special things in their classrooms, mm -hmm. but they're doing it on their own. Right. Having someone that's more of an expert can help support them and make sure that we're doing things pretty consistently across the district, yeah. um, I think is big. Right. And is it, is it, Different for elementary and junior high and high school. I mean, it's yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think, different. Yeah, I, I, I think there's different uh, different levels of appropriateness. Um, mm -hmm. You know, you, you asked about you know why is it controversial? I, I think because people get certain ideas in, in their head. You know, d diversity doesn't mean that any one thing is being promoted. And I think people think that that we're making you know trying to that the district's trying to brainwash kids and make them think a certain way. Mm -hmm. It's also not like that. The world is diverse. Plymouth is diverse. And students need to, you know, be aware of that and be comfortable with it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, every family makes their own choices on what they uh, believe in, but that doesn't mean that, you know, you, you can't shelter kids from um, the realities of the world forever. And right. so I, I think helping, you know, you know, provide awareness to, you know, Differences in culture and differences in lifestyle is important. Mm -hmm. you know, if we're, one of the responsibilities of the district is to prepare kids for life outside of Plymouth. Right, and right. And that's, you know, you know, and you've got to you know, know what the real world's like. Right. And Plymouth, unlike a lot of, of the other towns right around it, has a lot of um, children that speak other languages. Absolutely. Which must be not only um, hard for the kids to integrate with other kids, but to the learning aspect mm -hmm. of it, but also for the social aspect of it. Exactly. So is this position going to deal with both the social emotional end of this, as well as the learning end of this. Absolutely, absolutely. I, I think it's uh, it, it's a it cover, should cover a broad spectrum of things. And the reality is, being new, it's going to evolve. So yeah. I think we did a lot of work to try to you know put together, you know what the responsibilities are. Right. But I, I think it's going to really evolve you know over time. I, I think you know the more the, the more this person does, the more we'll see where where, where are gaps. Yep. Um, you know we've had. You know, there's certain things like, you know, we've had some ugly issues at, you know, incidents at some schools. Mm -hmm. Well, th that's one example of something where someone might be able to help. Mm -hmm. But I think the more focus is just more general awareness mm -hmm. and, you know, helping kids understand how certain cultures interpret something differently. You know, you, mm -hmm. you mentioned our, you know, immigrant population. You have a huge uh, concentration up in North Plymouth. Mm -hmm. You know, they come, come here with very different backgrounds. They yep. interpret things differently. Mm -hmm. Something that seems one way to us might seem completely different to them. Right. It's just providing awareness of how, you know, of how peop different people think. Right. Okay. Um, excellent. Uh, question number five. One of the roles of the school committee is to approve major adoption or revision of curriculum and textbooks upon the recommendation of the superintendent. Can you explain how the district sets, sets actually its curriculum and what standards are followed by the departments and how often this comes in front of the school committee? Um, 
It, I think it falls mostly on the uh, curriculum coordinators. You know, there's a, you know for you know the the the, the big high level departments. You have you know science, you know uh, math, English, etc. Can you um, tell tell me what a curriculum coordinator is? Because I don't think any other towns have those. Sure, um, that surprises me, but. In a, it, here, what we have, they are senior level administrators that basically oversee the curriculum for a particular, um, you know, educational area. So take, you know, math, for instance. Yep. They help ensure, one, that everyone that's learning sixth grade math in Plymouth is learning it in a similar manner. Mm -hmm. um, they support, they, they work directly with the teachers that teach those uh, subjects mm -hmm. and, uh, and and support them. So I think that's part, you know, the, the, the main uh, source. I would say these things rarely come in front of the school committee. Oh, okay. um, I, I don't, you know, I, I really don't, don't think the school committee has or should have a really major role in uh, curriculum. You know, are, that, that's to me what the professional educators and, you know, administrators, that, that's their job. Our job is to, yes, oversee things and maybe course correct if we see, if we believe things are going in, in the wrong direction. Yeah. But in general, you know, people aren't bringing, you know, books to us and saying, here, is, is this okay? Right. Um, and not necessarily specific books, yeah. but let's talk <clears throat> about um, just the fact that kids aren't going to college as much. Mm -hmm. they're, they're going to oh. trades more. Mm -hmm. um, what kind of skills should be taught at schools, not necessarily out of books? Oh, sure. Um, that, that's what I mean by, by kind of thinking thinking of curriculum. Yeah. Not just reading, writing, arithmetic, and language and science, but no, it's, it's the, other, the um, other things. And this has been a big, I'm on the... the school council for Plymouth North, because um, my, my son's a sophomore there. And we've actually had this is that kind of conversation and trying to think about how do we better prepare, especially our high school kids, for life post high school, right. regardless of what career they're doing. So we've, you know, I think there is a gap, uh, a need for teaching kids basic, you know, life skills, mm -hmm. you know, paying bills, paying your taxes, the importance of showing up on time, yeah. skills that apply no matter what career you're going to go into, whether right. you plan on being a plumber or a brain surgeon, there are certain things that, you know, apply. And right. so I think there is a need there and it's something we actually could use more focus on, you know, in turn, in, to enhance the curriculum right. that would apply to everybody. Now, is that something that the school committee would get involved with? Uh, I think it's something that schools committee could get involved with. And mm -hmm. I think there's two ways. There's, you know, the school school committee members can propose things to administration yep. um, and, you know, kind of, you know, try to push something mm -hmm. or the, you know, administration comes up with ideas and then bounces off. And so it could go both ways. So I definitely see that the school committee could be involved, mm -hmm. but it could be in different capacities. It could be just proving something versus, you know, uh, versus promoting something. Mm -hmm. And as far as um, the actual method of teaching, um, classroom lecture versus projects that kids work on together. How involved is the school committee with with advising on that whole aspect of, of the teaching experience and the learning experience? Yeah, uh, on a day-to-day -day basis, you know, very little. Again, yep. this is this is the job of the uh, professional administrators right. and the curriculum coordinators. Right. Um, you know, we would, I'd say the only time that I could see the school committee get involved is when something isn't going right mm -hmm. or there's a uh, complaint from a parent directly to the school committee and we're kind of forced to yeah. you know make a statement but you know those are really not the kind of decisions the school committee should get involved in our you know the role of the school committee is really policy yeah. and overseeing the superintendent and you know the senior administrators okay and just as a follow up what is what are some of the challenges that you find as a school or you will find as a school committee member that um, draw on other experiences that you might have had in your life to be able to help negotiate them or, or navigate them. Uh, you know, in my day-to-day -day job, job, I'm a technology consultant. I work with like large uh, utilities, so I have a lot of experience. For instance, negotiating very large contracts, mm -hmm. managing large budgets. Mm -hmm. um, so you know, so looking through the school budget to me is very uh, natural. Crunching numbers there. Um, I was a member of the. Uh, uh, negotiation committee that you know works on all the, the contracts with the uh, with, with, with the unions mm -hmm. here in town um, that you know was very familiar to me so I, I definitely apply things from my um, day job um, you know in general um, you know just uh, you know I, I think I've you know throughout my career proven ability to work with people of all sorts you know different mindsets different mm -hmm. backgrounds and stuff and so I you know, try to approach things very, you know, level-headed. Don't I don't, you know, come in with a particular uh, agenda. Mm -hmm. I just want to try to figure out what's, you know, what's the best solution for for mm -hmm. the students and families of Plymouth. Okay. 
in the last five minutes or so, um, address anything you, else you want to talk about that we haven't talked about and kind of tell the folks out there why you are one of the best selections to vote for. Sure. Um, I think I have, there's two, uh, two, uh, I won't say maybe hot button items that I'm mm -hmm. like trying to uh, help families with um, that we didn't talk about. One is supporting a kid just social emotional well being coming coming out of this pandemic. Um, okay. You know, being a teenager is hard no matter you know yeah. <laughs> whether there's been a pandemic or not. Right. Um, but I think right now there's a lot more uh, incidents of you know anxiety and depression. I think we need to do, be doing what we can to support those kids. Maybe mm -hmm. putting you know, a little less you know pressure on grades and tests and more you know, focus on just help, just helping prepare them for life after school. Right. Um, other thing that I've, I'm um, really trying to fight for the families of Plymouth is, is to continue the free uh, meal program for all students. Um, that was a lifeline for a lot of families the last two years. Mm -hmm. um, and I think this is absolutely the wrong time to just uh, rip that away from mm -hmm. families. So I've worked with uh, local legislators, written letters, mm -hmm. I've drafted a letter on behalf of the school committee um, that we're gonna send to our state legislators to fight for that. Right now, um, it's, Kind of, it's made it into the current uh, uh, proposed state budget, mm -hmm. um, but only for the 22-23 uh, the school yeah. year. Yeah. But one year at a time is yeah, okay. That, yeah, better than nothing, right? If we can at least get that that one year, right. and then once it's in there, it's easier to uh, uh, continue. But I would really like to see that program uh, continue. I think right. it does a lot for uh, families. Yeah, and just uh, one other question before you give your closing remarks: <clears throat> How do you feel um, the district did, and the teachers did, and the administration did? just pivoting so quickly in March of 2020 from we have school open to oh good grief we're gonna go fully remote I think they did absolutely incredible and as good as you could have expected anyone uh, yeah. to do there, there was no playbook uh, yeah. for this so you know it, people can always sit back and say things could have been done better or differently but to do as well as they did um, without you know any you know a, any instructions for how to do it yeah. um, I think you know Everyone from the administration down, you know, more importantly, the, the teachers and all the, and the staff yeah. um, just did an amazing job. We are very fortunate to have the staff that we have in Plymouth. Yeah. Okay. And <clears throat> why should people vote for you? Uh, you know, I m moved here 12 years ago with my uh, family, with my wi wife and kids. Uh, we looked all over the South Shore for you know the right place to live, and we chose Plymouth as a home for mm -hmm. a reason. Um, last year, I asked the voters to give me a year to prove myself. And I think I've done exactly that. Um, there's no shortage of uh, parents, teachers, administrators, students who will attest to the fact that I will put my time and energy where my mouth is. Um, I have worked tireless, tirelessly and will continue to, and I just ask that the voters continue to entrust me with the responsibility of representing them on the school committee. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Luis. Um, that was really wonderful, thank you. And good luck in your, uh, in your campaign and with the election. For our viewers, thank you for joining us. If you're interested in watching replays of this interview, please visit our website, pactv.org, slash elections for replay times and online viewing options, including PacTV's on-demand and streaming service, PacTV Prime. And please make your choices heard by voting in the election on Saturday, May 21st. Thank you and good day.